you very much, Professor Kassam, for your thoughtful and insightful presentation. It's an honor to be your respondent today. My name is Matthew Kamink. I'm a professor of Christian ethics at Fuller Theological Seminary. I also serve as the associate dean of Fuller, Texas, um, here in Houston. Uh, Professor Kassam's work is particularly insightful and interesting to me as I've recently published a book specifically looking at Muslim immigration and Christian hospitality in the West. Professor Kassam um, begins her paper by exploring how Muslim immigrants in America are cross-pressured between the threefold forces of racism on one side, xenophobia on another, and Islamophobia on the third. And while the rise of, intersect of these intersecting forces of alien alienization and dehumanization uh, in post 9-11 America. This story has been well told by many scholars, but what has not been explored nearly enough is the role of civil society and interfaith cooperation in actually combating the sociocultural power of racism, xenophobia and Islamophobia. And this is really where Professor Kassam's contribution truly begins. Zeroing in on the cities of Claremont and Pomona and their response to the refugee crisis and growing Islamophobia in America, Professor Kassam offers um, some important insights on the power of community organizing, faith-based action, and civil society. She outlines a wide range of services, programs, and collaborative events that faith-based communities within these two cities organized in response to their new Muslim neighbors. While the meeting of their practical needs is obviously important, Kassam is particularly interested in the impact these actions had, not on the guests, but on the hosts. Her discussions with volunteers and organizational leaders reveal an internal wrestling with some important questions of ethical, political, cultural, and racial identity and responsibility. She quotes one volunteer who speaks about how active engagement with the other has sustained and even encouraged her during a difficult and often depressing political season. Kassam quotes another volunteer who reflects on a deepening self-awareness of their own identity, their values and beliefs. Another voice reports um, that she has rediscovered the value of America's legacy of immigration and diversity and inclusion. Another uh, speaks about how embodied action with the other has transformed the powerlessness I feel, how contact with my Muslim neighbor uh, grew my sense of empathy. Another, ins they, another was inspired to want to march and protest against the forces of hate. Reflecting on these interviews, Kassam notes that contact with the stranger has helped to break down this common core of prejudice. She writes that these working relationships do much to break down stereotypes and build bridges. Beyond this, Kassam explores how the refugee crisis and the community's response gave birth to new civil society organizations within Claremont and new interfaith relationships within the community. In all, Kassam's paper clearly demonstrates three points for us that we must not miss. The first point is the ways in which embodied contact with and service to the Muslim other can potentially impact and form citizens. This contact can equip us to value and even defend American pluralism and democratic virtues. Second, she explores the ways in which critical moments of migration and the migratory crisis and response uh, are important opportunities to birth new civic organizations and interfaith collaboration. Third, she points out the ways in which American democracy and pluralism actually depend upon embodied action, civil society organizations, and these civic values. Um, the process of migration and this cross-cultural interaction between Muslims, Jews, and Christians, <clears throat> the, the contestation, the engagement, it seems, is actually a critically important ingredient within the democratic project itself. 
So when we engage the other, in this case, the Muslim immigrant or refugee, when we engage them in deep and meaningful ways, we're confronted by this deep difference and we're prompted to reflect on how we are going to respond and how we're going to live and navigate this deep difference. In receiving Professor Kassam's paper, a number of questions came to my mind. I offer these questions not as critiques, but as invitations to the audience to consider, reflect, uh, and imagine the broader implications of where this might go in the future. My first question is, uh, some of Kassam's voices noted that a growing sense of fear or frustration with the current political climate uh, was the initial motivator for them to engage their Muslim neighbor and to engage their local communities. My question here is this, is fear or political frustration a sustainable motivator for long-term civic action alongside the other? Furthermore, is frustration with Islamophobia, frustration with white supremacy, is this enough to sustain the good citizenship that we need? If it isn't, what social force could encourage a sustainable hospitality? Um, one that might, uh, might sustain an other-oriented love that American citizens need to sustain themselves in this current age of fear and recrimination. My second question is this. Professor Kassam's paper is a story about the social benefits of civil society organizations and organized religion amidst this immigration debate. And yet, we live in an increasingly individualistic and fractured culture, which is less and less interested in organized religion, civil society organizations, and interfaith cooperation. Volunteerism, civil society, and religious belonging has taken a serious hit in America in the recent decades. And as organized religions die, and as civic organizations struggle to recruit members and volunteers, where does that leave democracy? Where does that leave um, us in forming sustainable social action and in forming these civic virtues like tolerance, love, trust, and hospitality? In short, where will neighbor love come from without organized religion? or without civil society organizations? How will individuals cultivate these virtues? Whence hospitality? Question three, God is not really mentioned in this paper. God doesn't come up in the interviews with the volunteers or in Professor Kassam's reflections. And as a public theologian and Christian ethicist, I wonder to myself, what role does theology play in all of this community action, reflection, and organization. For the most part, when these participants reflect on their experiences, they draw on and voice progressive values that are generically Western and modern. They report a generic value of things like diversity. They use words like tolerance, and empathy, inclusion. They speak of democratic participation, marching. There is little in their words that is particularly theological or uniquely religious. Any, nothing unique from the generic values of a sort of modern democratic dogma. So did their faith in Jesus Christ or their faith in the Torah matter in any significant way? I'm wondering. And if so, how? What role does theology play, if any? Do these people engage their Muslim neighbors as generic progressive Americans? Or does their faith inspire a uniquely religiously informed response? Does theology matter? I wonder. Question four, and this is my final question. Professor Kassam discusses the power of racism and white supremacy as a critically important challenge facing Muslim immigrants in America today. Her paper asks, how can these forces be countered? Well, the black church in America has been resisting and countering the forces of white supremacy for centuries. 
And then as I listened to her presentation, I wondered to myself, what lessons might the Black church have to teach us as we engage this, this more recent issue of Syrian refugees and Islamophobia in America? While I'm going to allow my first three questions to hang in the air for the audience to consider and reflect on, I want to venture a brief comment or answer to question number four. And with this, I will close. In his book, The Beloved Community, Charles Marsh examines the role of the Black church in the civil rights movement. Marsh traces the incredible work and witness of Black individuals, institutions, and churches as they work to press for change, to advocate for justice, to resist white supremacy, and to reconcile a divided nation. In his historical investigation of the movement, Charles Marsh reflects and ultimately argues that the unique power of the civil rights movement um, for that particular moment came from an interwoven rope of three chords, public action, community formation, and theological direction. These three elements, when woven together, gave the movement and the Black church the public strength, focus, and sustainability that it would need to contest the power of white supremacy in America. In this, the Black church regularly engaged in acts of love, public acts of love. They supported one another through a beloved community, and they were directed by a Christological, Christ-centered theology of love and justice, public love and public justice. Through action, community, and theology, the Black church had a three-strand broke that was not easily broken by the forces who would mean to destroy it and secure its submission. Now, while their successes are inspiring and informative, so are their failures. Marsh also explores how the civil rights movement sputtered and struggled in the late 1960s and 1970s. When these civil rights organizations began to disconnect the three strands of action, community, and theology, they became disconnected from each other, from the mission, and from the source of their strength. In the end, a number of their organizations and their efforts began to waver, and ultimately they could not sustain themselves under the weight of white supremacy. So as a public theologian within the Christian faith, Professor Kassam's excellent paper prompts me to ask how the Church of Jesus Christ might engage our Muslim neighbors with a strong three-strand cord, action, community formation, and theological direction. Thank you again, Professor Kassam, for your insightful and generative contribution. I will not soon forget it, and I'm sure that the audience will not either. Thank you.